just got shut down and I actually got kicked out several times out of YouTube. I got problems in Facebook. They shut down all my ad campaigns just because I was in the crypto space, which leads me to people have been trying to make it anonymous, which brings in tumblers. Changing the world, one blockchain at a time, with George Levy, brought to you by Blockchain Institute of Technology. Hi, it's George Levy, and welcome to Changing the World, one blockchain at a time, where we feature the leading minds and personalities in blockchain, Bitcoin, and crypto. Today, we have a very exciting uh, show. We're going to be talking to Ivan Hong. Ivan is content lead for Request Finance, the all-in-one finance solution built for Web3 businesses. He's a development economist by training, and he discovered crypto in 2017 when he found that he could use Bitcoin to buy cheaper generic drugs from online pharmacies in India. What an exciting use to find Bitcoin that way. Since then, Ivan has written multiple white papers and industry reports on crypto, and his past clients include regulators like the Monetary Authority of Singapore, as well as Layer 1 protocols like Zilliqa and Filecoin. Cut to today. Today, he works with Request Finance, helping over 2,000 Web3 companies like the Sandbox, Decentraland, and DAOs like Maker manage their enterprise crypto payments. Since launching in January 2021, Request Finance has processed nearly $230 million in crypto payroll, invoices, and more. Ivan, it's a great opportunity. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. I'm excited to have you. Thanks for having me over. Yeah, I actually have been looking forward to this conversation because you're actually in probably the most, the most, I, I don't want to use the word volatile because it's kind of like almost a pun on Bitcoin, but just there's so much going on when it comes to just the intersection between crypto and traditional finance and yes. request finance is right there. So let me start. I have a couple of questions that I've been thinking about that I really would like to ask yeah. you. Now, one thing that I really, really want to get to is... Uh, there's all this volatility going on with other cryptos, but we have stable coins, right? Yeah. So stable coins actually prevent that volatility. So if they're yeah. actually not as volatile, if they're faster, yeah. why isn't everybody using stable coins? Well, that's a great question, George. Um, I think, first of all, we tend to underestimate how quickly new technology takes hold, right? I mean, back in 2000, there was an article in the Daily Mail that was saying that the internet may just be a passing fad as millions give up on it in the wake of the dot-com bubble. Um, so I think in the same way, we have to recognize that crypto adoption is non-trivial right now, and it's growing, especially because of stable coins. So according to the block research, the transaction volume of stable coins in August alone reached an all-time high of about $866 billion, which is about 87% of global cashless payment volumes in 2020. That's impressive. Wow. Um, but it's still true uh, that if you ask people whether or not they've recently gotten paid or paid for something in crypto that's not nfts um, most of them will say no right well why is that um, and i think one of the things that's holding back stable coin adoption is enterprises right um, so businesses are centers of value creation in any economy if they earn revenue in crypto they might want to pay their employees and suppliers in crypto and if more people are getting paid in crypto then they're also more likely to spend in crypto so that's why we think enterprise adoption is key but i think crypto payments today are not enterprise friendly at all for, for a number of reasons, right? So for one, it's very manual and error prone. Um, it's hard to do accounting or tax reporting, which is typically done in fiat prices. So for example, if you're an American business, you can't report your taxes in BTC or ETH, right? You have to do it in US dollars. Right. Um, and also the pseudonymity of it makes it hard to be compliant with AML regulations in the US and elsewhere. So starting from 2024, um, crypto transactions um, that are totaling 10,000 or less have to be reported as cash, right, to the IRS uh, and FinCEN as well. You've got to have identifying information like who you're sending to, what you're sending it for, and how, how you're settling that transaction, in, even in crypto. Um, mm. And you can't do that right now with Etherscan, right? Because all of it is just transaction hashes and wallet addresses that are not sure. identified. So what we've built changes all of that, right? We, we're trying to make it easy for companies to manage all of their crypto payments like invoices, salaries and expenses in a secure and compliant way. Uh, I, I just received a, uh, a message from one of the CEOs um, that using our platform today. He said, I used to spend one to two days a month just on making crypto payments alone, right? And now he spends something like 30 minutes every month when he uses request finance. And, and you know what, just in the full interest of transparency, we use request finance over at Blockchain Institute of Technology. And uh, it's very, very easy. It's interesting that you say that. 
because one of the kids I was saying, and mind you, just I don't really want to date myself, but I mean, I, I was a co-founder of an internet startup back in 1998. So back then, yeah. the web was not what we know as the web today. But a lot of the adoption curve involved, it just was hard to use. It really yeah. wasn't very, it really had not reached a point where it was easy to actually use it. Like nowadays, you, everybody has an yeah. email account, but back then, hardly anybody had an Dial email up. account. So we're at a similar pace. No, no, fascinating. Now, one thing I got I to gotta ask you, though, that's interesting, is uh, you mentioned the word pseudonymous, right? Yes. Because that's the thing that a lot of people sometimes when they think of, like, for example, a lot of people incorrectly think that Bitcoin is anonymous. It's no. actually pseudonymous. And, uh, and the thing is, uh, in Bitcoin, my Bitcoin address is my identity. And if you know my identity, you know who I am, right? Exactly. Uh, what I usually always say, you know, whenever I talk to people, I say, it's like, for example, let's assume that I'm a famous Hollywood actor and I go by Tom Cruise, right? Yeah. Well, that's not really his name. That's not, no. that's, that's, a, that's the name he goes by. But if the moment you find out what his real name is, you automatically know that that guy is that guy, right? Exactly. So it's the same thing with Bitcoin, which which is amazing, which leads me to people have been trying to make it anonymous, which brings in tumblers. And yeah. there's a whole thing. Uh, there was a big, big situation with Tornado Cash. And yeah. uh, that really just threw a bomb into the whole crypto market. What's your take on the use of tumblers and uh, Tornado Cash? So I, I think that Tornado Cash, first of all, is not designed primarily to evade sanctions because there are a lot of good reasons why you might want to hide your transactions, right? Um, so for instance, let's say um, let's say you're making a, a and this is very common even in traditional finance, right? If a large hedge fund wants to make a purchase, um, they don't want other hedge funds to know about it uh, because that sure. might move the price up, right? And that's a Com competition, really sure, absolutely. Um, or for example, if you're making, um, let's say, um, let's say donations to to a particular group of people um, that you don't want to reveal, for example, that it might be a like, low income groups, right? There's a good reason also to to have some privacy for your transactions. Um, you might also not want to have other people see what you're getting paid, uh, your, you know, your coworkers, right? You know, um, that's another good reason to hide transactions. Um, but yes, uh, I, I think there's a, a concern with how bad actors might be using systems like this because Tornado Cash was one of the, it's unprecedented in the US sanctions history. It is the first non-person, so it's a non-entity or non-individual that's been added to the US sanctions list. That has never yeah. happened before. Yes. Um, so it, it is a bit concerning to us because about 42% of our transactions are in fiat-backed stable coins and, and those are most vulnerable to censorship. Um, so about 30% of that transaction volume is USDC and about 12% is in USDT, right? So both of those can be sanctioned fairly easily because of their reliance on the banking system. Right. Um, but it's also important to remember that about 60% of our transactions are not exposed to this risk, right? Um, and I think the way that we try to manage our exposure to that risk is because we're chain agnostic and we're token agnostic. We support over 150 different tokens and stable coins and over 15 different blockchain networks. Um, so that way, users don't have to worry about being able to accept payments in any token or any blockchain, but it also limits our exposure to the risk of any one ecosystem failing or being censored, right? So for example, like Terra or, and UST, right? If one goes down or even, you know, God forbid, USDC, right? People can right. switch over to using other stable coins on request finance. Um, so if we are concerned about censorship um, and the vulner vulnerability of anyone a token to being shut down, um, diversify, right? Hit your exposure to any one stable coin that you were worried about, um, or either through a censorship, either because of censorship or because of a deep pegging event like UST. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think there's really much of a concern because at the end of the day, while the arm of the regulators is long, they can only go so far, right? Yeah, no, and you bring up a really interesting point because that's one of the things that I always cover in the sh in the show. Um, not just in the show and all my videos throughout all the time that I've been, because I, I dealt with a lot of times where I've been deplatformed multiple times uh, in the crypto space when there was everything that was going on in 2017 with ICOs, sometimes perfectly harmless informational videos I published just got shut down and I actually got kicked out several times out of YouTube. I got problems in Facebook. They shut down all my ad campaigns just because I was in the crypto space and I hadn't really done anything, but yeah. just because the rules said that they said that that was bad, even though it's a definition or opinion becomes yeah. a problem. And when you're talking about money, hey, if they shut down my, let's assume that I have all my money in uh, USDC. And mind yeah. you, I don't want this to happen at all. Yeah. Let's say I do <laughs> have some USDC and I want to go buy groceries for my family. Well, my money's no good here anymore. That's Absolutely. problematic. 
that's the part that I, I am very, very concerned about and where I look at, like, for example, Bitcoin to me is the fact that it's decentralized is actually such a huge, huge, like, I know that even in situations like Wikipedia, yeah. you know, when, sorry, WikiLeaks, what happened with WikiLeaks, right? Where mm -hmm. you have, like, you can't take U.S. donations, but you can actually take Bitcoin donations, right? Absolutely. So pretty incredible. So let me ask you a question because this is interesting. Um, so apart from this whole adoption of stable coins and mm -hmm. uh, just like where do you see opportunities for growth within the crypto space? Like you're you're in a position where you're like like your spotlight is right there on that spot. Where do you see opportunity now? So I think that cross-border payments in general is a key vertical where the pain points of traditional finance are the greatest. That means use cases like global payroll, remittances, international trade, and e-commerce. Because moving money across borders on traditional payment rails is expensive, it's slow, and it's incredibly frustrating when funds go missing. Um, so personally, I've, I, I used to work for a lot of US companies and money would just sometimes not show up, right? And they would have to, I would have to request that the banks do a payment trace, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and find out where the money went. And, and very often the answer is, I don't know, right? And in fact, the research study by Acuity estimated that in about in 2020, failed payments cost the global economy about $120 billion. Wow. Um, the study reported that nearly one in five, that's one fifth of organizations have a payments failure rate of between five to 10%. So five wow. to 10% of, of the transactions don't go through at all, right? Um, so I think that's, so cross-border payments are a big reason why we've got about $230 million in crypto payments so far to request mm -hmm. finance. A big part of that is payroll um, for global companies. The normalization of remote work during the pandemic and globally dispersed teams like DAOs have led to a rise in more companies turning to stable coins to manage their global payroll and crypto. Um, for domestic payments, I think it's honestly an uphill battle, right? And the reason for that is instant payment systems like ACH um, or UPI in India that are increasingly common around the world. And they allow instant zero cost transfers between banks. And in some places like Singapore, where I'm based, uh, we've even managed to link up our domestic instant payment system with other countries' instant payment systems like in Thailand or in Malaysia. So traditional finance institutions like commercial banks or central banks aren't resting, aren't resting on their laurels either. Um, but I think where DeFi and stablecoins need to come together as a package is where they, they can offer something that instant payment systems can't, right? And that is to provide access to superior yields on DeFi platforms. I think the day that DeFi platforms start generating reliable, sustainable yields on stablecoin deposits from real world assets or capital protected structured products like Sega Finance, uh, and those yields are way higher than banks, people will want to start to be paid in stablecoins because they want to save in stablecoins. So as you get gas fees come down with various scaling solutions and alternative layer ones, and yields in DeFi become more reliable and sustainable, I think over time, you might see that there isn't much reason to hold or accept fiat anymore. Um, so banks could possibly go extinct the way that ATMs made bank tellers extinct. Um, as right. cheaper, more scalable DeFi protocols re replace today's labor intensive and highly manual banking operations, frankly. Um, I think one of the very famous uh, points that I use to illustrate this is that in April of 2022, the IMF published a go the Global Financial Stability Report um, and it compared the cost of traditional banks and fintech banks, by the way. Mm. And they found that it was three to seven times that of DeFi platform. Wow. When your wow. cost of doing business is three to seven times that of your competitor, I think you're in trouble, model. right? Absolutely. It makes no business sense. And you know what's incredible about everything that you're saying is that, I mean, I'm even throwing into the fact that as we move more and more into the metaverse, right, where you're dealing in a digital space where everything is digital, yeah. right? And uh, so you won't even need the physical locations for the banks. Everything's just happening with a digital space. So it's an incredible opportunity where we're living right now. And uh, amazing that you're right smack in the middle. So Ivan, specifically for anybody that wants to know more specifically about what you're doing um, at Request Finance, everything you're doing with stable coins, everything, because you're in the Web3 space, how can they learn more about you? So if you want to check out Request Finance, it's completely free right now. There's no subscription uh, fees or anything like that. Um, you can go to our website, open an account at, at request.finance. Um, you also can check us out on Telegram. Uh, we're at, you can find me at ask.ivan. You can also find us on Twitter on, at request, 
request.finance as well. We're also on LinkedIn. So yeah, we're generally available. And if you've got any if you've got any interesting ideas for us, if you're using our product already and you've got some feedback that you want to give us, um, we're available on all our social media channels, Discord, uh, Intercom as well within the app itself. So definitely come check us out. Excellent. Thank you so very much, Ivan, and wishing you and Request Finance the absolute best. Thanks, George. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed this video and that you learned something in the process. I bring you brand new videos every single week, so make sure to subscribe to this channel. And if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. I would love to hear from you. Until next time, I'm George Levy. We're changing the world one blockchain at a time. See you next time.